keep worshiping him. Let your heart engage him. He's wonderful, filled with wonder. Begin to just let your heavenly language begin to flow. presence is here. We love you and honor you. Why don't we just hold hands across the auditorium. Let's begin to lift our voice just for our city, for loved ones, people that don't know Christ. I'm sure you have friends that you don't, don't know the Lord. Someone is lost without a spiritual life or reality. Come on, let's lift our voice and begin to pray. Pray for our city. Napier Hastings. For the neighborhood you live in. The Holy Ghost come. Holy Ghost come. Shela ba 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 shikala ba diya thai. Shela ba 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 shikala ba diya thai. Shela ba 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 shikala ba diya thai. Shela ba na ba la ma shala ba diya thai. Shela ba 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 shikala ba na thai. Shela ba 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 shikala ba diya thai. Shela ba 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 shikala ba na thai. Shela ba 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 ba. Lord, we lift our voice for our cities. Lord, for the region we're in, we cry for souls. We cry for people to be saved. People to be touched by the Spirit of the Living God. We cry for souls, Lord. Souls. We cry for people we know to be saved, to be attracted, to be drawn. We stand and pray, Father, at the throne of grace. By faith, we see them saved today. Very important when you're praying for people, not to see the problems or difficulties, but see through the eyes of faith. See, you know, God spoke to Paul and he says, I have much people in the city. They weren't saved, but he said, I have much people in the city. So we have people who are in the family of God and those who are about to be in the family of God. Just while we're just worshiping here, I just wonder, is there any person here in the meeting today and you're not yet a Christian? I don't know whether you realize what's been happening. We've been worshiping God and... It's been a wonderful joy and His presence has been here. 
And then we began to unite our hearts in prayer for you. We weren't just praying for our city, we were praying for you. Because we know someone prayed for us and someone shared with us that Jesus Christ came from heaven to earth, came to represent and reveal what God is like, that God loves people, and that God is concerned that we're separated from him, like a father's concern over losing his children. And that Jesus came and he walked among us and then he died on the cross. He gave up his life to break the power of this invisible spiritual force called sin that leaves our lives so disrupted and such a mess and such turmoil. What you're looking for, that peace you're looking for in your heart, only God can give it to you. Jesus said, my peace I'll give to you. It's not like the world. The world needs an external peace. Jesus said, I'll give you a peace that's inside you. It's the peace of being reconciled with God. Jesus said to everyone who received him, he gave power to become a child of God. So in a moment of time, you could just receive Jesus Christ. What a wonderful thing you came to church today. Someone's been praying for you. Today we were praying for you. All that remains is one more thing, and that is that you make a response to Jesus Christ, that you say yes to him. If you're in the congregation right now, just in this atmosphere of worship, and you want to give your life to Jesus, want to become a Christian, a follower of Jesus, is what a Christian is, not just a person who goes to church, so it's a person who follows Jesus. If that's you, I'd love you to raise your hand and let me know. Would you do that? Just raise your hand and say, I want to become a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus. I see a couple of hands over there. God bless her. Any others? Any other hands today? Just any other hands? It's a big good time to make this decision to be a follower of Jesus. Anyone else? Maybe you're thinking of it and you're a bit nervous right now. I'd be nervous if I was you too. I wouldn't know what was going on. I didn't know what was going on. I just put my hand up and then God touched me. It was wonderful. Then I figured it out a little bit later what had happened. We've got two people. Is there anyone else? Anyone else want to give their life to Christ? This is what I'd like to do now. The two people with your hands up. Would you like to come over here? I'd love to pray with you. Can I do that? Can I just pray with you? Church, just stay standing. Just keep in this atmosphere of worship. Guys, would like to come on over and we'll just pray for you. Just slip out from behind the seat and come over. Stay where you are, everyone. That's right. These couple of guys. Why don't we give them a great clap, shall we? It's fantastic. And you brought them along. How wonderful. That's fantastic. That's really good. Well, I'm so glad you're here. God loves you very deeply. And all relationships begin with words. When we speak words and we begin to engage and talk to someone, that's how relationships start. That's how it keeps going too. So what we're going to do is we're going to speak to God, and that's called prayer. And when we speak to God, I'll, I'll lead you in the prayer, and everyone will pray the prayer with you. So we'll all pray it together. Uh, we've all prayed it before, but we're going to pray it today with you. And so I'd like you just to close your eyes so you forget about everyone else. And right now, just in this moment of time, God wants to touch you. And so when we pray, listen to the prayers, listen to the words, then I want you to speak them and make them your words to Jesus, who's very near to you. We can't see him, but he's here. Are we ready, church? Let's help these, these two guys to pray this prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. Today I turn away from sin. And I turn to you, Lord Jesus. I believe you rose from the dead. Today I receive you as my Savior and Lord. I ask you to forgive all my sins. And I thank you for giving me a fresh start. I receive your spirit into my heart. And I give you my life today. Before heaven and earth I declare, Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. And my friend forever. Amen. Now I just thank you, Lord, for just what's happening right now touch them. 
Touch him with your love and your peace. Lord, touch him with your love and your peace today. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Let's give them a great big welcome to the family of God, shall we? I'm so glad you brought your friends. That's fantastic. You keep bringing your friends. Okay, then well, someone behind you is going to just give you a little gift. And uh, church, let's go and talk to someone. Say hello to someone. Just one minute. Let's go around and talk to people. Let's just take a seat now. Find our way back to our seats. Great to chat to everyone. Want to give you a great welcome this morning. <laughs> everyone wants to talk. Well, that's good news. Okay, let's be seated. Let's be seated. Let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome. Great to have you here today on a fine, tacky, sticky, sunny Hawks Bay day. Well, almost anyway, but overcast. But just great to be here. Great, to, great for me to be back. She wasn't back yet. She was away still. She's over in England. And uh, so we had to do a bit of a juggling act because we went from summer here to autumn over in, a uh, uh, winter actually, over in America, and then to blizzardy winter in, in England. So Joy was met with snow in England, and uh, so she's up there with uh, Kelly and, the new, and Peter and the new baby right now. But it's wonderful to be back, and thank you for praying with us and for us. We had a wonderful time away, just uh, had seven-day cruise, went down to uh, New, New Mexico, visited places there, and went out and touched whales, and Got that close to them, we could just reach over the side of the ship, uh, the boats. It's amazing. We, you know, did quad bike riding in the desert and on the sand dunes and snorkeling and, and a lot of talking and had fun together. It was just a great time for us. We also had some great meetings. Jurgen uh, from C3 in San Diego sends his love. They've got a tremendous church going there, and uh, we just had a blast. And uh, we had hundreds upon hundreds of people impacted delivered, touched by God. It was just extraordinary. Last night they did their equipping night and uh, so they invited me to do a, two sessions of equipping and uh, they opened it up and the, the place in the hotel was jammed. They had a sitting room only, people sitting on the floor and then God came and there's all kinds of stuff happened. It was a wonderful time. So very, very good. It was great to be back in Hawke's Bay. Great to be back here and uh, it was a hard call to make yesterday so sorry for those of you who went down to the to Paul. We got a phone call from the pool that because it's been cloudy for the last several days, the water's very cold. And at the time we made the call not to go, it was very cloudy and there was a wind blowing. And about an hour after that, that all changed. But that's the way it is in the bay, isn't it, eh? And uh, so anyway, it was, I think it was the right call to make. And so uh, that's it. We'll have to look at something else we can do. So if you had a picnic, I trust you took it to someone's place and shared it with them. That'd be a good move. And uh, Anyway, we've got a great day today, and if you're visiting with us for the first time, I want to make you especially welcome. And I wonder if anyone here, it's your first visit, first time to the church, 
We've got some people who just going to give you a little gift. And why don't you just raise your hand? We just love. Them. Who, who is it today? Anyone here? There's some people over there for the first time over there, right there on the on the right. Okay, and then someone over here. That's right, waving. God bless. Let's give them a great clap. Make them really welcome. Someone down here too. So great to have you here. We're glad you come. So glad you've come. There we are, and there's someone else over there. Fantastic. Praise the Lord. Make sure you keep your hand up till someone comes and gives you something. Ushers, can you give it quickly? There's another one over there. Hand up. There we are, over here. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's have a look and see what's coming up in the news. See what's happening. City, it's getting busy in the house. We have our impact group starting up again from the 7th of February. These groups are a way to get connected and there are so many to choose from, so have a look at the group list today. Equipping Track starts again for Term 1 on the 8th of February. This is your pathway to membership here at Bay City, so contact the office for more information. Prophetic Intercessors is back on the 14th of February. You are all welcome to come Pray in the harvest for 2012. Boost, flame, and all you men out there, keep watching. These are for you. Art Deco style and have some fun. <laughs> Girls, grab your feather bowers and guys, your bowler hat. Yeah, Sunday, yes. February the 19th at our 10 a.m. Yep. service. Speaker Wesley Campbell is here next Sunday. His teaching on praying the Bible will inspire you. He will be sharing at both our services and is not to be missed. Detour Cafe reopens its doors today, so why not head out there after the service and buy someone a coffee? Also, if you are new to Bay City or are visiting for the first or second time, you are most welcome to join our Bay Vision Lunch after this morning's service, where you will find out more about this exciting church. And just a reminder that our 6 p.m. service starts back tonight. Woohoo! <laughs> I'm waiting for more. <laughs> Fantastic. So come tonight. We're going to have a great time tonight. It's our first Sunday meeting for the year, Sunday night meeting for the year. Encourage you to come along, bring a friend, and I'll be preaching tonight. We're going to have a great move of the Spirit of God. And I'll come, come along and just get your year off to a great start. I know you're going to enjoy it. It'll be a tremendous time. Next Sunday, Wes Campbell comes from America. He's a prophet. His wife also is a prophet. And uh, they work in, uh, among churches up in Canada. And uh, also he's involved in missions in a very major way. And he has a ministry that, uh, uh, that raises uh, finance for orphans in a whole number of countries. And uh, he's particularly, particularly effective in doing that. And uh, God has given some insights and strategies. Great ministry. Come along Sunday morning, Sunday night. Bring someone along. It'll be fantastic. Well, Brighton's going to encourage you in that giving to the Lord. So come on, Brighton. Come on up. Good morning, church. Just before I... Uh get on to the offering. Just uh, calling all champions, all men, come along and support this event in a couple of weeks. It's going to be fantastic. We're going to have a fresh vision launch and share about the events we've got through the year. So I register at the back today. It's only $5 and that really just covers the food. But if you haven't got $5, it doesn't matter. Just register anyway and bring it on the night. 
Great? So come along and support. You know, in Proverbs 22.9, it says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed. And, uh, you know, I believe the kingdom of heaven is not just about giving, but it's about being generous. And, uh, you know, for me, I have an element of generosity around my life, but I know these huge amount of room for more. I want to increase and enlarge in my uh, generosity. And I've been talking to the Lord about this, and, and he gave me some, uh, some pointers. Last week, Joseph and I took the bus down to Wellington, and uh, Joseph was buying a new car. And we, so we got off the, the bus at Wellington Central Station, and then we had to get on another bus to go to Kilburnie. And as we came up the stairs, the bus pulled up, and so we went to get on it, and we realized we had no cash on us. And I said to Joseph, oh, have you got any cash? No, no. And, and this guy, he was kind of an oddball kind of guy, didn't look like he had a lot of money, a different type looking guy. He kind of turned around and immediately started opening his wallet to, to give me some money. And I said, oh, no, it's all right. We'll, we'll, have to, we'll find an ATM machine. And then I thought, oh, I wonder if the bus takes the, the FPOS card. So I kind of got lined up on the bus to get up and, and to see if it had an FPOS card. And he was, th this guy was about to pay and he turned around and said, no, no, I'll pay for you, I'll pay for you. And he got out $10 and he paid for my fare and Joseph's fare, which was $7. And it just blew me away. And I went and sat down and, uh, and uh, went, and, went and thanked him and sat down. I just began to close my eyes and pray for him. And as I prayed for him, because I, I was just blown away by his generosity, someone he didn't know, just so willing to pay. Actually, when he paid, he said to me, now, now you don't need to pay me back. I don't want you to pay me back. So I prayed for him, and the presence of God came around, and it was like God was showing me, this is what generosity is like, just seeing a need and, and, and doing it. And, um, and the funny thing was, so he, he got off at... Um, Halfway to Kilburnie somewhere, he jumped off the bus. We went to Kilburnie, picked up the car, drove all the way back to Lower Hutt and went to the, um, the Westfield Mall. So we were probably within 45 minutes of dropping him off in Wellington somewhere. And we're walking through the mall, and, and there he is there again, walking through the mall. I'm thinking, was this an angel, you know? <laughs> Seriously, was this an angel? Because I don't know how he got there when he was busing. But anyway, you know, the, these are the three things that God spoke to me out about. One... He listened and was attentive to a need. Second thing was he responded immediately and gave generously to the need. And the third thing was he gave without wanting anything back. And that really touched me. It really touched me. God spoke to me about that and just give me some keys of how I can be generous. Amen? Why don't we just stand up? You know, God's is such a generous God. He's abundantly generous. And God's calling us to be more than givers, but to actually be generous to the ones around us. Amen? Father, why don't we just lift up our finances? You know, you're generous today when you sow into God's kingdom. You're generous because you're seeing a need that souls need to be saved, that the church and the kingdom of God needs to be extended. Father, I thank you for everyone here. I thank you for their heart, their generosity. I thank you that, Lord, you bless those who are generous. Father, we bless you today and give into your kingdom. In Jesus' name we said, amen. Come on, let's just sing as we give to the Lord. Fantastic, Brian. I love everything on generosity. Tell someone I'm free. <laughs> hey, that's it. Okay, praise the Lord. Awesome. That's fantastic.
Great stuff. Uh, Wonderful. I enjoy it. It's great just to be back in our own music and worship and be at home. I like it. I always miss being at home. I'm okay for about a week and then I get a bit homesick. Anyway, I'd like you just let's have a quick look in, in, a, in a verse in chapter in Micah, Micah chapter two, and verse thirteen. Uh, sometimes I get messages. God'll give me a couple of weeks out. Sometimes I get them beginning of the week. Sometimes during the week. Sometimes on Friday. Sometimes on Saturday. Occasionally on Sunday. <laughs> I hate the ones I get on Sunday. I find that quite stressful. But uh, on the other hand, I found that listening to God and flowing with him gets you the best results. And uh, when I woke up this morning, it's like I woke up and suddenly it's almost like I heard a voice shouting in my head. It was the Holy Ghost. And what he spoke to me was this, it's time to break out. And if there's anything that you get out of this message today, I want you to get in your heart, it's time for me to break out this year. Time for me to break out of the limitations, time for me to break out of the restraints, time for me to break free of the things held me back and begin to start to have a greater impact with my life. And uh, we'll just read in Micah chapter uh, 2, and, and I want to, it's not the scripture we're going to stay in, there's one in the Old Testament that the Lord spoke to me out. But look at this verse here, and it says, uh, it says in verse 13, the one who breaks open will come up before them they will break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. Their king will pass before them, the Lord at their head. So what it's talking about, the people of God, and it refers to Jesus Christ, and it calls him the breaker, the one who breaks out, the one who demolishes limitations, the one who breaks, bursts out into new territory, the one who breaks out of current ways of thinking. And in every way that you look at Jesus, he was definitely a breaker. He broke the culture, he broke the customs, he broke the traditions, he broke in almost every kind of formal thing that would have restrained God's people. And the, the word there to break is exactly the word that has followed it when it says they will break out. So when we determine in our heart to follow Jesus and begin to live our life to honor and please him, then he wants us, as a result of that, to break out, to break out and have influence with our life. Christianity is, an, uh, Christianity is about an army advancing a kingdom. And so often what we do is we get to like our experience with God and don't realize actually it's all about breaking into new territory, breaking into new areas, breaking open new things. And uh, just staying comfortable is found nowhere in the Bible. Not at all. Not at all. The Great Commission, the last word Jesus gave to the church, I'll just say, you know it, go. That means break out. And what could be simpler? Break out of your limitation. Break out of your mentalities. Break out of the confinement. Break through your fears. Break out. Go and make disciples. Make people into followers of Christ. So that is what Jesus commanded the church. He commanded the church to break out and invade new territory. And like all churches, it didn't respond so, so quickly. Let's have a look quickly in Acts chapter 1. I want you to have a look about the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Baptism in the Holy Ghost, wonderful. You're not baptized in the Spirit speaking tongues. It's a great experience. It's an essential experience to live in the Spirit. But notice what it's for. So Jesus told them, I want you to wait until the Holy Ghost be poured out. So what he says here in verse 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Then you shall have meetings where you'll laugh and fall over and great things will happen. You'll see visions, have dreams, see angels. You'll be so impressed with the angels. You have all these things happening. That's what will happen. Well, he didn't mention that, but that's just the side bit that happens. Actually, as a result of understanding what baptism in the Spirit's about. Baptism in the Spirit is a gateway experience into the realm of the spirit and the supernatural that is accompanied by the mission or the purpose of God being performed. In other words, you shall be witnesses unto me. So the outcome of being filled with the spirit, having great meetings, being touched by God, is that your life becomes a clear witness of the reality of Jesus Christ. 
To become a clear witness of that reality, we've got to live in freedom, and we need to express that life. I think that guy that uh, came up to Bryden and just uh, offered to pay when they were short of money, that to me is a very practical expression of it. Something of just generosity to a complete and utter stranger. So the New Testament church broke out eventually on the day of Pentecost. Of course, there was a breakout. 3,000 people say, what you've got to realize is this is the very city in which the founder of Christianity was murdered, was hung on a cross. What an amazing thing to start a church where your founder was murdered. Of all the places you wouldn't want to start, would be, that's the one you wouldn't want to start. And no doubt you'd have a better plan. But Jesus said, no. In the place where the problem was the worst, the solution will be the greatest. And so he poured out his spirit and he sent them out. And if you follow through the New Testament, I'll just look at one more verse. And I want to go to where I'm going in Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. And you'll see them breaking out. Now, they didn't break out easily. Jerusalem was a very religious city. And the people who lived in it took on the culture of their day, and they were also reasonably religious. So although there was an outburst of the Holy Spirit, religious confinement or tradition meant they didn't actually do what Jesus said. Notice what he said, you receive power from on high, and you'd be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. He added more, you know, and in Judea and Samaria and the utmost parts of the earth. So Jerusalem, our home city... Judea, our region, Samaria, into our nation, and then the nations of the earth. We've got to be reaching into all aspects. And so they were a bit reluctant to do that. So it's quite interesting to see how God solved the problem of reluctant Christians. Here it is here. And uh, so there was at that time, verse uh, chapter 8, there arose a great persecution against the church. Isn't that nice? And therefore, verse 4, those who were scattered went out preaching the word. So God got them all out there eventually, didn't he? How about that? Great, great difficulty, a great opposition came. And so sometimes the difficulties we have, sometimes the challenges we have are not challenges because we're advancing the kingdom, but they're challenges to get us out of the comfort zone and get on course that our life counts in taking territory for Jesus Christ. Winning souls, reaching people. And so, notice there that those who were scattered, it doesn't say they were anyone important, it just says those that left Jerusalem and went to other parts, everywhere they went they shared about Jesus Christ, everywhere they went people won, and even, de uh, even Philip, who was a deacon, a helper in the church, he went out and preached the gospel, preached about Jesus Christ. He is the one, the message is not about Bay City, the message is not about some great experience, the message is about a person, it's about Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to have a look with me. We're going to go to where I want to go, which is Scripture, Lord, put in my heart. It's found in 2 Samuel chapter 5. 2 Samuel chapter 5. So the end days, you've got to ask yourself, how's this going to affect me? Or what's this going to do for me? Where do I get on this? Everyone has got some place we need to break out. So if I ask you the question, when did you last lead someone to the Lord? And it's a long time ago. You need to break out. Okay? You need to break out. If, there, if, if I ask the question, is there an issue or a fear or a thing in your life that's stopping you fulfilling what you know in your heart you're called to do or want to do, then that's an area to break out. If there's uh, limitations around your life and you think, man, I can't do all I'm supposed to do, that, that God wants me to do all I've got in my heart, there's a limitation, it's to break out of it. So everyone today will have something that God wants you to break out in. And as a body, he wants us to break out in the engaging intention and connecting with people who don't know Jesus. So I want you to read with me in 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 17. Now the Philistines heard they'd anointed David king over Israel. And all the Philistines went up to search for David. And David heard it and went down to the stronghold. And the Philistines also went and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said to David, go up. I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into your hand. Isn't that good? Go up. You'll win. So David went to Baal, Baal Perizim, and, the Lord, and David defeated them there. And then he said, the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like the breakthrough of water. So that's why he named the place Baal Perizim, meaning the Lord breaks through, or the Lord of breakthrough. And he said, because the Lord has broken through my enemies before me like a breakthrough of water.
And so they left their images there, and David and his men carried them away. Then the Philistines went up once again and deployed themselves in the valley of Rephaim. And David inquired of the Lord and said, you shall not go up. And he said, you shall not go up. Circle around behind them. Get them from behind. Come upon them in the front of the mulberry trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees, you'll advance quickly, for the Lord will go out before you and strike the camp of the Philistines. And David did so as the Lord commanded him. That's a good statement. And he drove the Philistines from Geba as far back as Giza. Isn't that fantastic? What a great, what a great thing. I want to pick it up and just open it and show you some things the Lord just dropped into my heart this morning. Uh, reading verse 17 now. The Philistines heard they'd anointed David king. So the Philistines were a very warlike people. They lived and dwelt in what's modern day Palestine now, lived uh, on the coast. Their name means literally to roll in the dust. And they were very violent. Uh, they, uh, they worshipped idols. Uh, and they were a constant threat and a constant uh, irritation to Israel. And uh, while Samuel was a uh, prophet in the nation while he was alive, they were held back by the anointing that he had on him. Once Samuel had died, the Philistines began to invade the nation, taking city after city, until the nation became deeply oppressed and impoverished because of the Philistines. Now understand, then the Philistines heard of David being anointed. Now they hadn't heard that before. They didn't know about that before. Now they heard he's anointed king. Anointing is to empower you to do something. Every believer is anointed by the Holy Ghost. Every believer is given an anointing, a baptism in the Holy Spirit, an initial experience, but it's an empowerment experience. David was anointed. When God anoints you, his anointing is for a purpose. The big mistake is to look for experiences and separate your experiences from the purpose. I love experiences. I can't get enough of them. But if I separate experiences from the purpose of God, then the experiences become a deception. They become a trap, and we become irrelevant to the purpose of God. It doesn't matter how great the experience is. It is to lead, from, lead you nearer to the Lord so you'll bring people nearer to him. And so uh, you're anointing. God anoints us for a purpose. When the Holy Ghost was poured out, we read in Acts 1.8, it was for a purpose that we would make Jesus known. Second thing you notice there is it says, in that verse it says, they heard that David had been anointed king. Kings, notice, it didn't say he was not a prophet or a priest or anything like that. He was anointed a king. This is what upset them, that he was anointed to be a king. Here's the next thing. Kings have dominion. Kings have a territory they rule over. God anointed David king because he had a purpose for Israel to advance it and to establish his kingdom in the earth. When you get anointed by the Holy Ghost, it's because God has in mind that you would, as a representative of heaven, advance his kingdom. How much did the kingdom advance last year because of your efforts? What advances were made, either at a personal level or in the realm of influencing others? Ask the question. So David was anointed king, and kings have a territory, and kings dream of how they can enlarge their territory. Saul failed in his kingship because he did not understand that he was a king in order to advance the purpose of God. The moment he stopped advancing the purpose of God and just enjoyed the status he had, that's when he lost the plot and lost his kingship. Now, you and I are called. The Bible tells very clearly in Revelations 1 verse 5, we, he has made us kings and priests unto God. In Revelations 5, it says, He has made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on earth. So you have been given a kingly anointing. And you are expected to reign or to have a kingly influence in the earth, in the earth. It's not about waiting for some great thing one day. We are expected to advance the kingdom today. And all the teachings of Jesus talk about the kingdom and the advance of the kingdom and the stewardship of individual believers of the gifts that God has given them. And God expects an increase from us, all of us. He expects us to be productive, expects us to be fruitful. So David was anointed king. You were born for dominion, and you should dream of it. So if there's anything in your life, 
If you've got a bondage in your flesh, a bondage in your life, you are called to have dominion over it. Set your face, you'll find a way to break free. Set your face that this is not acceptable any longer. If you have an addiction to smoking, then this is a bondage. Set your face that you will expand the kingdom in your life and have dominion over it and begin to figure out or find out or get counsel how to break through that limitation. You have a sin area in your life, a habit in your life, a fear in your life. Determine this year, I will break through that. But then there are other parts of the kingdom, and that's where we represent Christ in the community. So every one of us has a positioning in the community, assignment. You have people you meet, I'll never meet, and probably most of the people in this church won't meet either. They're in your territory. So wherever you go, your territory includes your personal life, your finances, your relationships, and wherever you are. And so wherever we are, that's our territory. And we're not to rule over people. We're called to rule over spiritual influences and to advance the kingdom of God by being his representative to people, serving people, as you heard of earlier on today. And so you are a king, and we have a commission, and it's a very clear commission. Go make disciples. Go make followers of Christ. Don't make church sitters and pew warmers. Don't make people who just come along and Sunday's their church thing and the rest of the week they just do what they love. That is not a Christian. That's not a disciple. That is not a disciple. Disciples are follower of Jesus. We're following Jesus. Then we align our life to begin to walk with him, to discover his purpose and to fulfill that purpose in our life. That's a disciple. Disciple, he said, follow me, I'll make you a fisher of men. A disciple is a fisher of people. That means you put the right bait out and you catch the fish. Aha. Uh -huh. How many did you catch last year? Hey, how many did we catch? How many did we catch for Christ? I love fishing. I absolutely love fishing. I like going fishing with Brent Douglas. Brent's a great fisherman. He knows how to catch fish. A lot of people go out and you get in the boat, catch nothing much. I hate that. Just boring, get seasick, and it's just come back tired and cranky. Uh, but it's good tiredness. Uh, but when I go out with Brent, uh, Brent, it's very focused on fishing. I went out in the boat with him one time. He said, well, here's the rule in the boat. Don't talk. I said, oh, that suits me fine. I don't want to talk anyway. So that's great. Well, we talked all day there. <laughs> but we were focused on fishing. And he showed me how to put the bait, how to hook it on properly. He showed me how you set your line up so you can catch the snapper. And, and he had this big chest there, and we come home full of snapper. I've been out several times with him, but he knew how to set the bait, and he knew how to catch them. And he showed me some things that you do. I can't remember them all, but he showed me some. I caught fish. That was, I didn't catch the big ones he caught. There's a way of catching the big ones, too. A real way of catching the big ones. Here's the thing, though. You have to go where the fish are, and you have to lay out something that will draw and attract them, and then at the right time, you hook them. If you don't have the right bait, you don't get any fish. If you don't go to where the fish are, and he would move this boat around all over the place till he got it exactly where the fish were. He said, it's no fishing anywhere else. The only place you'll catch them is where they are. Make sense? Okay. So, so the fish you'll catch this year aren't here. They're there. Think about that one. So that means you need to turn up there with an intention of fishing. And you don't always catch fish. And uh, sometimes you get a bit disappointed, but if the fish are biting, you catch them. And so you've got to have the right bait, you've got to have the right way of hooking them. There's a, there's a bit of skill in it. And through the year, I'd love if we can begin to start to set our heart that we can begin to lift our game plan and vision that we'd see people saved for Christ. Individually, right across the church, one person. Sure, one person could come to Christ because of you. Some people come very easily. Some of them come, you worked hard on this one, they didn't respond at all. And you were someone over here and suddenly they come to Christ, you didn't do hardly anything. But that's how it is. You do that. So there it is. So, so there's no, now here's the other thing then, is there's no advance of the kingdom without resistance. The third thing, no advance of the kingdom without resistance. So when David was anointed king and planned to advance the kingdom, first thing the Philistines did when they heard about it was get up and jump up and go kill him. They wanted to kill him. When you set out, if you just want to just sort of be a casual Christian, you'll have to live your life below what God wanted. We're called to be productive and fruitful. That's fantastic. 
So here's the thing, that the moment you step up and decide, I'm going to break out of this limitation, break out of this bondage, break into enlargement, you will encounter resistance and difficulties. If your prayer life is slack and you say, I'm going to really work on my prayer life for the next two, three weeks, get myself back into shape, you'll find resistance. Uh, if you decide you're going to break out of some bondage, there will be resistance. The demonic realm notices people who are intent on a mission. Every time I ever go overseas, I always have something happen. Before I go, while I'm there, and when I come back. And uh, it's always the same. And I've just learned to shrug it off as being part of the resistance that comes. So before and after this trip, I had things happen. And I I've learned to just shrug them off. Just, what's that? Just nothing. Keep on course. And we were away, we had lots of things happen, <laughs> but funny things happened. You had a guy manifest in the room next door, I haven't had that for a while. He was groaning and moaning and yelling for, for about a half an hour, I suppose. And then we had the power just go out on us. We had a whole lot of little things like that happen. We had a great, it's just nothing, it's just pff, little stuff, pff, little stuff. Yeah? So you've got to learn to just hang in there. So, so, the, the, so the Philistines go up and their one thing in mind is kill him. Take away, kill him means take away the life. So the devil wants to take away liberty, freedom, and life from you so you're bored and passive and dull without fire for God. How we need to keep the fire every day alive. You get inspired on Sunday, but what's happening Monday through Saturday when you get up and begin to pray, begin to push through your limitations and establish your positioning in heaven next to the Lord and begin to decree, today I speak and command by day, everything shall align up according to the will of God. I call blessing over my day today. I stand and take dominion over all assignments of the enemy and cancel them in Jesus' name. Today, everything will work together for good for me. You've got to learn to get assertive and get up and start the day in prayer and make decrees and declarations of the Word of God. Your life will be in alignment with the Lord. And demons, before they even come to you, you're on them. All over them. That's the spirit of David, eh? So David, yeah, all these things, and these things happen to him. So there may be We'll find there'd be resistance. The interesting thing here is when I read the, the giants, the, the, the Philistines came and they, they got themselves into this place called the Valley of Rephaim. And I looked up about that and what I found was that Rephaim, they were descendants of the Nephilim, but they were the formerly a race of giants. And it's in this plain where the giants used to live, that's where the Philistines decided to set the battle. And I began to realize that there are sometimes patterns of thinking and fears and strongholds and issues in our life. And behind every one of them is some giant stands there intimidating you. Now, the giants actually had all been killed off by Joshua. All that's left is the memory of them. All that's left is the name. There's no giants there. But in that place where the giants were named and where they once fell, there was a battle currently with the Philistines. And it's like that Christ at the cross has legally defeated every enemy, defeated every bondage, defeated every demon that would come against you. But you have to deal with the memories of those things and the thoughts of those things and the attitudes of those things and rise above it. I have felt God speaking to me about this and I've been purposing in my heart to this year push out into a whole number of personal areas. It's good. You never quit, never give up, never retire. See? So I know there's a few people out in a retirement village, but don't you get a retirement spirit around you. It's all over. It's all over spiritually for you. You're not earning any more fruit in heaven if you have that around you. We don't retire. Just keep getting fired up. Oh, we're in a retirement village. Well, great. Let's start a prayer meeting. Let's start to pray and believe. Before all these people die and go to hell, let's get a few of them saved. And some of the staff, why are we doing that? So we've got all these activities they've arranged. Well, let's get to and start to pray, agree, and talk to them. And they can't escape because they all live in the village. Now, all it needs is just one or two hot-fired 
gospel, Holy Ghost filled, tongue speaking believers, let's get the village saved. Eh? That's your territory if you live there. If no one got saved, then what happened? Why did you go there? Hey, glory to God. So we want to catch some people. If you're at school, young people at school, you need to believe God to break through the giants of fear and intimidation, rejection. See some people saved. See some people touch. It takes a bit of work. You've got to sow and work at it. And, of course, there's always a resistance comes from the giants. So they call them to the place of battle in the place they have memories of giants. So I have no doubt that all of us this year will have some challenges, and it'll probably be over issues like fear or rejection or shyness, all those kind of stuff. But you've got to see what David did. Now, here's what I like about David. Let's read what it did. It says, the Philistines heard that they'd anointed David king over Israel, and they went up to look for him. Now, this is what I love about David. David immediately, as he heard about it, went straight down into the stronghold. The stronghold was his place, where he, his, his fortress. So when he heard, it's on, there's a fight brewing, immediately calls all the soldiers together, get them all armed up, and he's on. I'm going for it. Now you notice, he's already gone out to battle before he's even asked the Lord about whether he's going to have a fight or not. Now that, what that tells you then this amazing insight to David. What it tells you is he had a warrior spirit. No one's going to knock him back or put him down from what God called him to. Warrior spirit. Got a breakthrough spirit. Interesting, all these guys around him got the same spirit on them. So notice, he's immediately, someone stands up and challenges him to a fight. It's on. Now that's a fighting spirit. It's a fighting spirit. I've seen a few nasty people around town at times, and you look them in the eye, and suddenly they want to take you on, you know. That's not a fighting spirit. It's just they're plumb angry and mad at something, and they're looking for a fight. Well, the Philistines were looking for a fight, and David said, it's on. That's what I'm called to. I'm called to be a warrior. The only time he failed was when he stopped going out to the fights. So he had an anointing to go out to the fight. He had a spirit of might on him. Never lost a battle, except an internal one. Now you and I, would you believe it, have an anointing for a fight. Well, if you've got fears in your life, fight them. If you've got some depression around your life, fight it. If you've got some demonic influence, fight it. And then there's some resistance in the community to people coming to Christ. It's in the spirit, fight it. Fight it. Let's get something around us that gets gritty and determined and not namby-pamby and wussy. I can't stand it. And it, I just can't stand it. And I don't mind if we lie and stand and weep and worship and do stuff, so long as we're not wussy on the inside. That when the fight's on, you're there and you're counted. You get up and get standing in the battle. We need to have that around us. David was both very tender, very soft, worshipping man, spent a lot of time in the presence of God. But oh, he was a fighter. And he, he fought the public battle with the giant, was fought after the private battle with the lion and the bear. The lion, the demonic spirits, the bear, the crusher. And that usually speaks of the flesh, speaks of iniquities in our family life or personal life that try and crush us and stop us doing anything. And he took them on as a young boy with a sling. And then he went out, and when time came to take on a giant, a biggie for the whole nation, they were ready. They were all ready. So I don't know, what are you ready to pick on this year? I think you should decide what you're going to pick a fight on. Really. I said, you don't break out if you just wait for something to happen. You've got to decide, this is what God is speaking to me about, the challenge and the change, and I'm going to pick a fight with the devil on this one. Until, and then I'll have a plan, and I'll stick with it until I break out. Why don't you see quickly David's plan, then we'll just finish up. I want to show you a clip for three minutes that just touched my heart when I was looking at it. So the first thing is, <laughs> so the first thing, he, just, he immediately goes up. So the first thing is, you've got to take responsibility. Until... You make a decision in your heart that you will make a change and it's quite specific. Nothing will happen. Notice what he did. 
He took responsibility. He had to wait to be told to go out and get ready. He just immediately donned the weapons out. He's gone. We've got, a, we've got these, this army showing up here. We're going to go down and give them what's what. They're not walking in here with it, having it easy. So the first thing is you've got to take responsibility. You face the issues and take responsibility. Uh, let me ask this, and this is the thing I'm feeling a deep challenge at. Have we taken responsibility for people around us that don't know Christ? Have we taken responsibility in the workplace for its spiritual atmosphere and, and for speaking and praying to change it? Have we taken responsibility to be the shepherd to the people that are there so they find someone that's different in the workplace that reaches them? Have we taken responsibility? If we haven't, that's your first place to start. Have you taken responsibility to pray for anyone? They'll never change till someone begins to pray and then has a plan. So number one, we need to take responsibility. Second thing is revelation. He asked the Lord what to do. And basically what he's answering is this. Now notice this. He's already gone down, clothed with all the battle gear. He's all got all the soldiers all caught out and we're all ready to go. Then he says, well, what do you reckon, Lord? Should we go out to that fight? And if we go out, will I win it? That's good questions to ask the Lord, isn't it? Should I pick this fight? And will I win it if I do? Now, that's good, that's good prayer. Asking God, should I go to that one or not go to that one? Should I take that on or not take it on? See, so notice, although he's got a warrior spirit, he's also sensitive to the Holy Ghost leading. He listens to God. He inquires of God. He gets revelation. And God says, go up, take it head on. I'm with you. You'll clean them out. He said, that's what I wanted to hear. So up he goes. Has a battle, defeats them thoroughly. So, number one, we need to take responsibility. Number two, we need to get revelation. We need to get insights on what to do and where to go. So you don't go big-headed and take on everything. You've got to take on what God gave you. And the third thing is, you notice, response. He took action and he engaged the Philistines. Now, I, I, listen to the thing. You'll never change anything unless you engage it. To engage it means you commit to getting involved. We have to engage with people if we're going to help them change. We have to engage the issues in our life if they're going to shift. If you're happy to live with them, great. That's fine for you, good on you, well for you, but me, I want to move on in my life. I've decided I'm going to push against some things. So, so we need to make a response. And the response is that we've got to take some kind of action. You've got to do something. So it's all very well to get wound up and get prepared and well do to pray, but you've actually then got to put a plan down and do something specific. So anyway, God showed him even how to do it. Go up and take him on head on. Third thing, a fourth thing you notice here, it says after he broke through, he says, verse 21, they left their images there and David's men carried them around. Notice that David addressed the root issue. The root problem they had was what the power was behind these people with these idols. And he's making sure we're not having any idols left around here. He dealt with root issues. If you're going to deal with problems in your life, deal with the roots, not just the behavior. If you don't change the root system, what you believe in your heart and what's motivating your heart, then the behavior performance thing doesn't get you very far. So a lot of people try with their willpower to make things happen in God. It doesn't happen that way. It doesn't work that way. You've got to leave the Holy Spirit to help you identify and deal with the roots. They discovered the idols. They discovered the root cause of this problem they were having, and they burnt them all. They just got rid of them all. Now, here's the next thing is, is that you have to resist because whatever you face and whatever you determine to do this year to break out, there's going to be, it won't be just one battle. You'll have to have more than one, but you have to keep working at it. You have done these things, you've got to keep persevering. Oh, I reckon that if you can just keep persevering and not quit, you'll probably break through and win. Because you just outlasted everyone and everything else. You just kept going and wouldn't be stopped. So you need to resist. So the next time the enemy comes up, notice the next thing he does is he gets fresh revelation. Now what, what, what this means is this. He never assumed that what he did last year would take him through this year. He never assumed that his gift would get him through. He never assumed that his past experiences would give him what he needed to get the victory. He needed to get the victory. He needed God with him. For you to get victory this year and see breakthroughs, you need God with you. You need God with you. So you've got to continually ask him for direction. And the Lord said, notice what the Lord says. So he says, don't go up and take him head on. I've got a changed plan. 
Oh, here's the plan. The plan is now is you go sneak up around behind them, go around, around the long way, come up behind them where they're not expecting it. And then he says, wait until you hear the, the movement in the trees. In other words, he said, there will be a supernatural movement, and on that movement, then you initiate your action. So you notice how on the one hand, he's got this warrior spirit and determination. On the other hand, he's incredibly sensitive to the directions of the Holy Spirit. And if we're going to get, see things change in our life, have influence and whatever, it, maybe it's in your marriage, maybe it's in your family, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit and get some insight on what to do. We need to listen a lot more and then get busy doing what God said to do. Whatever God said to you do to last, do it. Okay? And so he goes out there and he routes them thoroughly and this time they don't return. This time he decisively drives them right back to the far end of the land and reclaims the territory that had been lost in the reign of Saul. What a great thing. So he truly broke out and his fame was established. So here's a couple of questions to have a think about then, just as we finish up, and I want to share a little clip. What are you going to do this year? What will you do this year to break out? What can you do? First of all, start off by dreaming and thinking about what do you want to change in your personal life, your finances, in your family, marriage, what your, your, whatever it is. Just begin to dream about it. You've got to have a dream. Ask the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Begin to get the dream. Then, uh, and, and not just in your personal life, but what about in reaching or winning or influencing someone? One of the simplest things to do is find what you love doing and then do it with unsaved people and get them involved and draw them in. It's quite amazing what people... Uh, I just said to the guys when I was away there, hey, I love guns. Can we go shooting on Monday? And immediately it was amazing how many people come out wanting to go out and just do some stuff together. Quite amazing. You've got to do some things together. And then secondly, then, what's your limitation? What is the limita limitation that's stopping What's stopping you? Is it your past experience? You had a bad experience or two? Is it some uh, thought pattern? Is it some habit pattern? Is it a bondage you need to break? Identify what the limitation is because that is your hindrance personally that you've got to get through. And then you may need to upskill to get through that. You may need to learn something new. You may need to go into equipping track, get some training. If you're not in a small group, you need to be in a small group where others can encourage you in fulfilling your dream and, and uh, ask you how you're getting on and pray with you and stand with you. And finally, it'll be, what will you do? At the end, what are you going to do? So have a think about it. What is it I want to break in? Where do I want to break out this year? In my personal life, marriage, family, and specifically in reaching the community. I need to do something. I need to break out. I need to break out. Tell someone next to you, you need to break out. Someone is waiting for you to break out. I've got a little clip I want you to watch. <clears throat> if you could just play the clip now. I've got it up YouTube. And it's uh, called Evangelism. It's called Girl on a Park Bench. There you are. Just have a look at this. Here I am, desperate for love, for truth. What are you going to do when you leave this building? Are you going to share with me what you've been learning here today? Or are you just going to bottle it up and pull it out next week for your friends? Now, when I say share, I'm not talking about every tactic you've used on me in the past, like judging my every move, telling me I'm a bad person, pointing fingers, giving me disgusting looks. <laughs> and my favorite is when you tell me that I'm lost. I don't even know what that means to be lost. Do you really think judging me is going to make me change? Would it make you change? Now, I, I know I'm a bad person. I've, I've done bad things. But I don't need you to tell me that. What I need is for you to pick me up when I fall down. To be there when I'm broken. Yes, there's, there's something missing in me. There's a void in my heart that I don't know how to fill. You have it. You have that thing that makes you whole. You know that person that I need to know. So I'm watching your every move. I'm watching where you go and what you say and do. Because I'm desperate for something real. I need something genuine to know that there's something more here than this. I mean, this, this can't be it, really. And I think you know that. Listen to me. I need you. I need you to be here for me. 
I need you to walk out right now, ready and willing to do whatever it takes. Hey, it's, it may not be comfortable. It may not be easy. But I need you to show me love. No matter the cost, show me what unconditional love really looks like. Stop telling me about this God of yours and show me who he really is. Honestly, I'll probably resist you. I'll probably argue with you and laugh at you. I'll, you know, even when you fall, I'll probably call you a hypocrite. But don't give up on me. Please don't give up on me. So I'm going to ask you, when's it going to happen? Just close their eyes. A very powerful clip. Don't give up on me. What will you do? Just listen to the Lord for just a moment, what he's saying that you need to do, that we need to do. It starts with just that one thing. What do you need to do this year to impact some unsaved person for Jesus Christ? What do you need to do? You need to learn how. You need to break out of the limitation of current relationships. Do you need new skills? Do you need... What do you need? What, what do you need to do? Father, we just pray that you put in our hearts today people that need to know Jesus Christ. And that, Lord, we not walk out and just forget what we've learned. Lord, this year would be a true year of breaking out to see unsaved people connected to and engaged with, intentionally connected to, with a view to winning them to you by demonstrating the love of Jesus Christ, the wonderful compassion. We may not see a leper, but we can see someone who's really full of shame, defiled by what they've been involved in, that needs your help. We may not see a cripple, but we'll see people whose minds and emotions are crippled by the experiences they've been through. Why don't you just now, just as we finish up, I don't want to finish up just with a big song or anything. I'd like just to pray with someone next to you that they will fulfill what God spoke into their heart. They will truly break out and impact someone's life for Christ. Did you do that? Just find someone near to you and pray if you can move in a prophetic word, move in a prophetic word. Just pray and let's believe for God to touch someone's heart. Just pray for that person next to you. The problem is never what to do. The problem is having a heart to do it. God, give us a heart to do this.
Have a fantastic day today. Hope to see many of you back tonight. And let's believe for God to touch lives, touch hearts. And to get with someone and take them out for coffee or go somewhere together and reach out to some people, friends of people. Owen, we'd like to pray with you today. Owen's going to uh, Indonesia and Singapore and going up to preach the gospel for a month. So we want to lay hands on him and just see God bless him in his work. Don't forget to pray for Pastor Dave. He's up in Pakistan right now. Big challenges up there. So just continue to pray for him. He'll be nearly a month away. Those of you who know Sue Seeger, don't forget to go and say hello to her. She's back for a week's holiday from Australia. Thank you, musicians. What a great job. Thank you, sound. Thank you, lighting man. Thank you, technicians and AV. Appreciate your work.